and hello and welcome to another art jam it is wednesday september something september 8th and uh this is our last art jam before josh gets back from the unreal fellowship and uh i am alex alvarez the guy who started Noman a really long time ago and uh Today, we're going to play with Maya and ZBrush. I think that's what we're going to be doing. And uh, so hopefully things are working and you guys can hear me. And so as far as I know, it seems to be working and it seems like we're live. But I don't know for sure until somebody says something. So somebody say something. Just a thumbs up that you hear my voice. And let's see. I'm going to get my camera switch over so let's go and get that on just so you can see my screen let's go and do that let's get rid of our little overlay don't need that and i see people hello thanks for joining brock hello dan thumbs up thank you sweet then uh cool then i guess i'm going to start talking about something i think what we're going to do today is uh continue with what i was playing with last week and i think that's going to be uh what we're going to do and so last week if you recall we talked about layout in maya and so what i'm going to do today is probably play a little bit more with the layout for this scene, and then we'll uh, sculpt it in ZBrush. I doubt we're going to have time for texturing. So last week, I kind of showed for one object how we would send it over to ZBrush and sculpt it. But now um, that I've kind of shown where we're going to go with just one asset, or I'm going to kind of do the whole thing. And we'll see how far we get. And so basically, uh, I'm building something from scratch, uh, really just for fun. And so last week we started with just an empty Maya scene and I talked about, you know, just roughing out an environment uh, using really simple objects. And so we started with this simple plane and sculpted it in Maya. And these are all super simple objects that are just used to block out, you know, how things are looking to camera. And, uh, and then obviously all of these things get sent over to ZBrush to be sculpted and detailed and then sent over to, um, mixer for texturing obviously there's a lot of other programs that can be used for texturing such as substance but uh we'll probably end up trying mixer for all of these things um and uh yeah and so maya works really well for doing this kind of layout just because we have a true 3d camera and i can work to the camera which is something that's uh not really great in zbrush and so just so I can position objects and figure out where I want things to go, that's kind of why I did it this way. And then we have a little cave behind us. There'll probably be larger objects filling the sky later on. And then the intent with all of this was that I was going to go and block this out in Maya, and then we'd end up uh, in Unreal as sort of like the where we do the final rendering of this little environment. And so I think before I jump over to ZBrush, I'm just going to figure out if uh you know kind of what this little space is i was thinking about it a little bit while we were making it last week but uh for this week i think i'm gonna think about it just a little bit further and uh for those of you who are new to art jam it's pretty casual and so um i do have like a larger project that i was working on back in may with this thing called the unreal fellowship that i did and i made this short uh as part of this crash course in unreal and uh and so I was going to be working on that project in Art Jam, but then it kind of seemed that that was going to be not ideal for me just because I'm a pretty busy with Noman just getting ready for the reopen of campus uh, next month. And uh, so I think it's actually uh, something that for Art Jam for now, anyway, I'm just going to kind of, you know, uh, discuss different techniques on different Art Jams and for now, I'm just going to build something from scratch, something new that started last week instead of trying to continue on that project. I think I'm going to get back to that a little later. So anyway, but uh, but the techniques that I'm using last week and this week, um, and I know I'm talking a lot, but uh, so you're just looking at my screen. But if we just go and switch back to me for a second, 
and let's go do that. All right. So basically what I'm talking about is uh, this short that I did with Unreal, where the techniques of blocking something out in Maya, going to ZBrush, texturing, and going into Unreal is something I did a lot of on that project. And so since I didn't record myself making anything for that project, I thought it'd be useful to just do it on stream so you can kind of get the general gist of, of how that workflow um, is done. Because I think while it's really cool to use things like Bridge and uh, uh, the Quixel Mega Scan ecosystem to create an environment in Unreal, and that's great for set dressing. To build an entire environment just from those is not something that's going to necessarily be uh, as common. It's a fun thing to do, um, meaning that if I go and actually, I'm going to get my monitor back. If I go and open Bridge. and wait for that to open. So yeah, so if I open Bridge, as we can see right here, and we look at some of the 3D assets, what I'm saying is that, you know, using things like all of these models that are in here, whether it's uh, props, as we can see in this category, or whether it's some of these cool sort of organic rocky assets, yeah, you can build an environment out of these from scratch, but from a you know point of view of working with concept art, they're trying to match or working in production. Generally, these are great for set dressing, but you're not necessarily going to be building entire uh, scenes or environments just using um, kits because of the fact that you have to deal with art direction and and design. So, but these are great for set dressing, you know, for populating your sets. So yeah, so basically. What I have here isn't everything that would be in the final environment, right? And so this is just like the most important elements just to block out the space and then I'll set dress it once we get into Unreal. Uh, so as far as what this area is, um, I'm not sure really because I was making it randomly last week. But what I think I'm gonna do is have, you know, this kind of be the entrance is this cave that's here so basically we're entering this little courtyard type area through that cave there's some sort of you know whether it's a little stream going down the middle that's terminating here and what i figure at this point will probably be some kind of altar and uh which you know as far as what the design for that will be i'm not sure but that's probably what's going to be down in this area and that's something that we'll also probably make in zbrush just so that there's a focal point because right now there really isn't one and uh i see mr nice hello sir and uh thank you tosbin cool to see some people in here uh so yeah lost my train of thought so yeah, I played a whole bunch of Ghost of Tsushima over the last couple of weeks and finished the, the DLC. So there's a lot of little temples, you know, so in that game. And so where you kind of like get your way through uh, a space to kind of locate these different temples that uh, um, have items, a lot of headbands. But anyway, I'll probably put something like that in this area. So yeah, so if I just go, we'll see that I have a couple different saved cameras in this view. But starting on this one, let's see. I think I'm going to just do a quick redshift render just so we can kind of see. This is already in memory from before. So with this render, if I go and select the light, and there's the sunlight right there. And let me actually get this into world space. So I can just play with the lighting a little bit inside here. And I think what I want to do is that if this is going to be, maybe if this is like a stream, it's kind of going down, maybe it pulls in this area right there. So I kind of need some piece of geometry I can use to test that. So I'm just going to load in a, a water plane. So it's just on my shelves in Maya, I've got like pre-built models and assets and things that I've made. So this is really simple. It's just a ground plane uh, that has a water shader on it. So you can see that just loaded in. And so I can select that inside here. And if I lower it a little bit down to the ground, I can kind of see 
if there was going to be water and I wanted to pull down at the edge, I might need to adjust my geometry and sculpt on it a little bit. So I'm going to figure out like the height of the water first. Because once I know the height of this plane, I can figure out if I want to do any sculpting. I'll probably have the water be a little lower like that. Okay. And so now what I need to do is that was done to camera. So now I'm going to sculpt on the ground a little bit. So I'm going to select the ground under mesh tools, sculpting. I'm going to go to the sculpt tool. And then with that active, I'm just going to change my brush radius. I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. So usually I would have this on another monitor, but for the stream, obviously, like this. So the point being that now, if I were to sculpt, then basically I can sculpt and it'll update in my render while I'm sculpting. And so I can just figure out if I want there to be more of like a pool of water where this altar is gonna be at the back, I'm just gonna sort of lower the geometry back there so I can see this pool. And then I can switch to a different camera. And so I'm just going to switch to this camera now. And so I'm just lowering the geometry in that area just so we get more of a pool of water back there. Okay. And then I want to sort of look around to see if there's other areas where the water's popping up. So I can see it's popping up right here. So I'm going to just lift that area a little bit. So I'm going to hold down the B hotkey and just sculpt to lift that up. And then I can see my ground or my water plane isn't quite big enough. So I'm going to select it. Just move it and scale it up. So it's filling that area correctly. And then I'm going to go back to the sculpt brush, select that geometry, and then go back to sculpting. So now I need to do that. Now, granted, I could have this water like going downhill or something like that, but I don't really want to deal with that. So I'm going to, meaning it's a lot easier if it's just flat. And since we're just doing something as a fun experiment, that's how I'm going to do it. Here I can see we've got this geometry here that's kind of like poking through. We can resolve that when we get into ZBrush. But I'm going to just go and do a quick fix here. So you can see that you can sculpt in Maya. It's not like it's amazing or anything, but just for blocking things out, it's useful just because of the fact that while I'm doing it, I'm looking through a render. And I think that's kind of acceptable for our scene, but there I'm going to lift that a little bit as well. And I think that's kind of all I need to worry about that. And then for this geometry back here, that's another question of whether I want to have like cliffs surrounding this. So if we come through this cave and into this little opening courtyard thing, then I probably are gonna I'm gonna want taller cliffs surrounding it. That might be a really easy thing to do once I just get into Unreal. So I don't know if I'm going to worry about that right now. So this is probably all I really need to do prior to jumping over to ZBrush. So I'm going to pause my little Redshift render and close that. And I'm going to save my scene.
All right. Okay. So at this point, do I want to play with anything else? Yeah, I think I'll probably just go to ZBrush. It's easy to jump back to Maya later if I need to. Um, just check how things are working to camera. Because one thing, another thing that I can check is, you know, all this stuff is obviously going to get smoothed, right? So if I select geometry in here, like let's say I go select a bunch of this stuff, and I just hit three, it's what's going to happen when I subdivide it in ZBrush. And then obviously once they start sculpting, the shapes of these things are going to change. And in ZBrush, it's kind of hard because it's not a true OpenGL 3D camera to figure out how that's going to change sort of like the, whether it's the player perspective or whether it's the, the composition I want to do for like a camera move in this environment. Because like, let's say I was going to end up rendering a camera move in here. Like I can test that real quick with my, with this camera. So I'm going to select this camera and let's say, you know, at frame one, set a key on it. And then I'm going to delete this keyframe that's right there. And then let's say we just go to this point and let's say this is where our camera move stops. And let's say that it's going to be, you know, uh, five seconds. So I'm just going to go and hit a keyframe on it at frame 120. And so now if I hit play on this, we can see that the camera is moving. So like if this is one of my shots and what I'm doing that I am obviously going to be considering like if these things compositionally are working. And so that's why I'm going to have to go back and forth maybe between ZBrush and Maya um, for that stuff as I sculpt them and change. And, uh, and this is another thing that's also easier to do in Maya, just uh, the way I was able to just take the camera and set some keyframes on it and figure out a possible camera move. Um, okay. So to go to ZBrush with this stuff, um, obviously all of the topology on everything is going to change. So I'm not concerned about topology at all at this point. These are just really simple objects. They're going to get um, divided, sculpted, retopologized or remeshed in ZBrush, sculpted some more, and then end up back in Maya to check things out for how they're working with camera. And then once I feel like my sculpts are done and my geometry is done, I'll be in Maya at that point and then send that stuff to get textured uh, in Mixer. And then once it's textured, then send it over to Unreal. So um, to send all this stuff over to ZBrush, there's more than one way uh, we can do it. Um, we can do it one at a time, which is kind of time consuming, or I can just do it uh, with everything at once, which is what we're going to do. So I've got all this geometry. It's all grouped together. And last week when we blocked this out, I did something where I froze the transforms on my object and made sure they didn't have any construction history. And so and that should still be the case because I haven't added any new geometry in here. Um, and... Uh, for Khan, can Maya handle all that geometry after ZBrush? Yeah, because I'm not going to be sending millions of polys back to Maya. So if I have something that I sculpt in ZBrush, that's, let's say, a couple million polys while I'm sculpting in ZBrush, I'm then going to Z remesh it down to probably, you know, 15,000 polygons. And then that might have a normal map or a displacement map. And so the amount of polys that's going to be sent to Maya isn't any different than the amount of polys that would be sent to, to Unreal. Um, and granted, with future workflows with Unreal 5, where Unreal 5 can handle like massive polygon counts, that's where having Maya as a middleman becomes a problem because Maya can't handle millions and millions and millions of polys in viewport. So we'll see, you know, like what changes with workflows at that point, because um, then you might be going, um, you know, from Maya straight to Unreal or from Zebra straight to Unreal. But the issues is that, you know, like there's a lot of hype right now around Unreal 5 and the polygon counts. But the thing is, is that if you look at the Valley of the Ancients demo that you can download for Unreal 5, it's like 100 gigs for just one level. Uh, and so unless people are planning on games becoming terabyte downloads, which I don't think is going to happen, um, people are still going to have to optimize geometry and keep the polygon counts in check um, just for efficiency's sake from a drive space perspective. Um, so yeah. 
Uh, let's see. So do I retopologize the mesh after I sculpt in ZBrush? Yeah, but I do it in ZBrush, uh, just using ZRemesher, because since environment assets are um, static, I don't. they don't need like an animatable topology. So it works really well for things like rocks in the ground. Uh, Jacob, is it possible to attend Noman purely off financial aid, even for housing? Um, I would recommend reaching out to admissions who can answer the specific questions in much more detail than I can. I can. Um, a very high percentage of Noman students, just like at any college, um, are on financial aid. Um, but the specifics and the specifics as they relate to you, I would really recommend just reaching out to admissions because they'll, um, for free, work with you and just figure out, uh, you know, what you would be eligible for and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, for sure, people definitely get financial aid to help, not just with tuition, but also with cost of living, meaning things like housing. Um, all right, so, and I am also, so by the way, I'm just like, I'm perfectly happy for people to answer, ask questions at any point, you know, it will kind of pause what I'm doing on screen just because my brain tends to kind of, you know, I'm uh, focused on one thing at a time. I'm not the best multitasker when it comes to answering a question, but uh, I'll try, but you're definitely welcome to ask, ask questions about whatever. So yeah, so I need to send this stuff over to ZBrush again. If I create a new object and I have construction history on, just want to remind you guys that if I make a new sphere and I put it in the scene, if you look in the channel box and let's say we also rotate it, none of this stuff is zero, right? So you can see it's tiny for you guys, but it's it's all got numbers on there. It's not zeroed out. And this thing has construction history, right? Meaning I can still change the number of subdivisions. And so I don't want that if I'm going to send things over to ZBrush. And so I'm going to select an object like this and I'll delete history on it. So it gets rid of all inputs. So now I can't change the subdivisions on it through history. And I would modify freeze transformations on it, which now means that all of these translate, rotate, and scale values all get zeroed out. So now if I took this object and move it over here and rotated it, and I go over here and I hit zero, it's going to go back to that spot. So I like to do that for objects um, before I send them over to ZBrush, just to make sure things uh, end up in the right spot as I go back and forth. Um, and so let's say the house hermit is uh, has answered you, Jacob. That's cool. Thanks, hermit, for answering that. All right, cool. So to go to ZBrush. Now, I don't need the plane that's inside there for the, well, maybe I do want that we're talking about the plane for the water that might be useful to have eh. Eh. no i don't care so much about that so what am i going to send to zbrush um so in this folder or folder this group that's called block in i've got all of these objects and these are what i want to send over so like i was saying earlier i can send them one at a time or i can send them as uh all at once and that's obviously way easier because there's a lot of pieces it's not that many it's like 25 objects um now the way that i do it is i tend to just export these as an obj so i can select all of these objects so there they are i can make sure for all of them that if i just hit the left or right arrow uh, left or right arrow keys on the keyboard I can traverse the hierarchy and I can just scan channel box here on the right, upper right, and see that everything is zeroed out. I tend to like double check things like that because I'm anal. I want it to cause a problem later. So select everything and then file export selection. And for this, I'm going to export it as an OBJ don't need materials and click export selection and then in the Maya project that I'm working in so I made a new Maya project last week for this project it's just called ArtJam 090121 so and in the standard Maya project uh, which has all the standard Maya project directories 
there's a directory in here called data. And so in that directory, it's usually empty. And so I last week created some new folders in here and uh, I have one in here called to ZBrush. So that just helps me as I'm moving geometry around between programs, I kind of put things in the right place. So for this folder that's called to ZBrush, which is what I'm doing, you can see I have some things that we did last week. And uh, I'm just going to go in here and just say, this is my, you know, environment block in geo. And that's an OBJ. I have materials off because it doesn't need to export a material. And I'll hit export selection. So environment block in geo. So that'll export quickly, obviously, because this is all super low res geometry. So if I select all of this stuff, it's uh, not a lot of geo. I mean, the ground plane, because I subdivided a bit, has a few. It's like 18,000 polys total. So now we're going to jump over to ZBrush. Um, so I've got a new instance of ZBrush open. So there's nothing in here, just a default sphere um, Z project. So I'm going to go and switch out here. I'm going to just switch to Polymesh 3D and I'm going to go and import. And now I need to find my project, Maya Projects Art Jam 0901.21, data to ZRush. And in here, there it is, environment block in underscore geo dot OBJ. And if I click open, and then control N to clear the canvas and then drag and hit edit. And I'm gonna get rid of the floor so I don't have to see that. All right, I'm gonna hit P for perspective. And then there's a geometry in ZBrush. So fairly simple to be able to do that. And, uh, but what we'll see is if I open the subtool palette, it's just one subtool inside here. So I need to break this apart. Um, and so it was separate objects in Maya. It's just when you export an OBJ with multiple things selected, it just creates a single OBJ, but it's not like these things are welded. So in the subtool palette, if I scroll down to where it says split, you have different ways to split a subtool. So this is again, just one subtool, go up here. And uh, let's look at here. We've got group split, uh, split to similar parts, split to parts, split unmasked, split masked. So I'm going to do a group split. And if you're ever curious about uh, what things do in ZBrush, you can just hold down the control key and it'll give you like some help of what things do. And uh, let's see, fast asleep. That's funny. That's, that is a good point. Um, the leap that's awesome 2008 that is definitely a while uh yeah auto groups split groups um it depends on whether you have like you know poly groups and stuff like that on your mesh right now this doesn't have uh that necessarily so but meaning not user generated if i hit um polyframe though you can see it did create poly groups based on the fact that they aren't welded meshes but I'm going to go in here and hit group split and hit OK. And then there you go. So if you look on the right, you'll see I've got a whole bunch of subtools, meaning all of my objects are now in here. And now I can sculpt on them if I want to. And there you go. If I hit uh, polyframe, now it's obviously going to do it for whatever uh, subtool is active. So I can hold the Alt button and click on whichever subtool I want to sculpt on. And if I don't want to see the wireframe, I can just click on that. So that is getting it into ZBrush and then getting it out of ZBrush back to Maya. Same thing. You can do it one at a time or you can do a, uh, you can merge all of them into a single subtool and export that as an OBJ or preferably under the Z plugin palette, you can, you have FBX import and export. And so that's what we'll, eventually use. So we're in ZBrush. So what to do first? I'll probably start with the ground because 
things are kind of obviously built upon that as the foundation. So if I alt click on the ground, then that's going to highlight. And so the first thing I probably want to do inside here, as you can see in the cave, that the ground doesn't extend all the way inside there. And so let me just make the cave the center of our view. So yeah, you can see that the ground doesn't extend all the way into the cave. So I think I'm going to extend it in there first because that's simple enough. So let's just go to a top view. And also the cave, you can see how it's kind of displaying funny. That's because it's uh, double-sided, it's not on by default in ZBrush. So I'm going to go and alt click on the cave geo. I'm going to go down to display properties. And in there, I'm just going to turn on double sided. And so you can see now the cave doesn't look as weird. And so basically, that kind of shows me that little part of the inside of the or interior of the cave, like how far I need to extend the ground out to. And uh, let's see. So if I click the uh, little transparency opacity button right there, then you can see that kind of also helps me. Uh, Jacob, you're right as far as using Gozi, for sure. Um, let's go to the move tool. Um, yeah, one disclaimer when it comes to software and me is that I don't profess to be an expert of anything. I use a lot of tools and a lot of programs and I know them okay. Um, but sometimes I might have a workflow that's just the way I do things and it might not necessarily be the way other people do things or the right way. So if you see me some, do something where you know there's like a way better way to do it, you're definitely welcome to point that out to me. I'm more than happy to to learn things that'll save me time for sure. Um, you know, that's one thing with Nomen and, and the Nomen Workshop, which is our sort of streaming library, is we've had, you know, hundreds of people do titles over the years, and there's so many different ways to do the same thing. Um, and as far as what's right or not, um, it's really more a matter of what's the most efficient. You know, if one way is faster than another and would save a bunch of time, then I would consider that not necessarily a matter of being right, but being better because you're going to save time. So I'm extending this out just so it fills the cave there, the ground. So there we go. Jacob, have I ever taken a class at Nomen? Me? Uh, of course. It's been a while. Um, back in the early days of Gnome, when I, that's something that I would do more often, um, because that was a big part of why I started Gnome, was I just still at that point, 25 years ago, felt like I had so much to learn, and I still do. Um, so, um, so I would take classes. So it has been a little while. I watch a lot of the Gnome workshop stuff, because that's easier to do from home. Um, and I'm still, you know, involved uh, on the titles that get released with the Gnome workshop. All right, let me see. That's done. Let's get rid of transparency. That's extended out. All right, so that's cool. <clears throat> there are a ton of classes. I mean, if I could like enroll at Nomen and like do the two year program, like that would be amazing. Just take two years and 80 hours a week, just focus on learning would be so awesome just because I think that when you're a student you kind of like are obsessed about getting a job and then once you get a job and time goes by it's you tend to romanticize college and the fact that like for two years you were just learning and doing personal work and all that kind of stuff so it's it's kind of like a grass is greener thing always but uh, I'm always very envious of our students and the fact that they're just not only learning new stuff all the time, but they're learning the current state of everything because all the teachers are working. So they're learning the current, you know, state of whether it's Maya or Nuke or Substance or, you know, it's a long list or Houdini. I don't know. Things keep changing and it's just fun to learn all the new stuff. So I'm going to check the topology on this geo. So you can see, obviously, it got stretched. So if I go in here, 
and I hide everything. <clears throat> the topology for the ground looks funny. And so that doesn't matter though, because I'm going to remesh it anyway. And I'm going to remesh it now because of the fact that it looks all stretched and I want to sculpt on it. Um, now, one thing to point out is that I'm going to Z remesh it. I'm not going to use Dynamesh. I'm not going to use Dynamesh probably on anything that's in here. And the reason is because nothing in here is closed. You know, so Dynamesh, if you had something that is open, like it has a hole in it, it's going to close that hole so it becomes like a solid piece of clay. And I don't necessarily want it to do that for something like my ground plane or for something like the rocks that I put in this scene. Because if I make them all visible and let's say we click on this dude and let's hide everything else and let's focus in on this guy, you can see that it's open on the bottom. And again, for because of display properties, if I scroll down to there. So you can see it's open on the bottom. So if I use Dynamesh, it would close that, it would fill that hole. And that would just become like a waste of geometry once the stuff starts getting subdivided and then Z remeshed and UV'd. It'll create an issue with seams because since this is open, if I UV this, it's very obvious where the seam should be. But if I close it with Dynamesh, then it's not obvious to ZBrush anymore where the seam should be. So I'm going to start getting seams in places that'll make it harder to use tileable textures as opposed to projected box projected textures. So I'm just going to primarily probably avoid that, meaning Dynamesh for this. You know, like if you're making a character, then obviously Dynamesh is the most amazing thing in the world. All right, so select the ground. Let's just, for simplicity's sake, we can see the mesh. And I'm going to shift click on the eye. So that's the only thing visible. I'm going to go to geometry. And then there's the Z remesh of palette in here, which is something that was added years ago to ZBrush. And it's really like one of the biggest time savers there is because retopologizing things is tedious. So the number of polygons it subdivides it to, I don't really care at this point. I just want it to even out the topology. So I'm just going to leave it, everything at the defaults and click Z remesher. And now you can see it remesh it. So it's super fast because it wasn't a lot of polygons. The heavier something is, the longer that process will take. And so now the topology is clean. Um, the polygons are evenly spaced. They're all quads. And so when I subdivide this thing and sculpt, it's going to be fine. So I'm fine with that. And so now I can start to think about subdividing this thing. So if I click on the uh, geometry sub palette and click divide, then it's not going to update the wireframe until I, unless I turn it off and turn it back on. And now you're going to see that it's got uh, a lot more geo. I'm just going to scan comments again. So sometimes I'm going to forget to look over at comments because it's on a different monitor. Um, but I, I'm just going to scan C. Ash Blossom, that's awesome. So yeah, all of the terminology for 3D is definitely intimidating at the beginning. But once you know it, you know it, you know, because these new terms don't necessarily enter the lexicon of CG all that often. They do, but you know, um, once you kind of get the basic terms down, you're going to be good. Uh, Devin, my PC config is a uh, Lenovo 620 workstation. Um, I've got a 2080 Ti in it as far as the card. Um, I've got 192 gigs of RAM and uh, SSD drives internally for software and then an external uh, array for storage. And an array meaning it's... Uh, it's called, I think, the Lacy Big Drive. It's got five drives that act as one, so it's faster. And if one of those drives die, you don't lose any data. So it's kind of like a way to have uh, safety with your data. Um, and it's a, something that it, all of that stuff adds up and gets expensive. But once you lose data, you start to get paranoid. And arrays are really cool. So there's RAID 0, RAID 5, RAID 1. Um, but it's something worth looking into if you're working on your own. All right, so let's go out here. Let's see. Um, 
lot of CG gets easier. ZBrush adds a bunch of new tools to speed up workflow. For sure, it does. Uh, I did not build it myself. So uh, fortunately, Nomen has an IT department. And so when I need a new computer or have issues with my computer, then I can go to the awesome people in the ID department who know everything about computers and are way faster at troubleshooting issues than, than I am. So that's one nice thing about once you work at a company is that you'll they'll end up having an IT department and you'll be able to get advice from them about computers. Um, but obviously, if I was younger and on my own, I'd build a computer because it's way more cost effective to do that. All right, so I'm going to divide this thing up. <clears throat> so if I keep an eye in the upper corner here where it says active points, it's uh, at 309,000. So I'm going to divide it again. Now it's at 1.2 million. I could divide it one more time. So if I divide it again, <clears throat> it would go to, you know, 4.8. It multiplies by four every time you click divide. But I don't think I need that many polys just yet for this. Um, you used to use Quadra a lot in Maya to retopologize. Now I know I can just use the remesher. Oh yeah. Use Z remesher. It's amazing. So I obviously will retopologize things myself if I have a very specific way that I need the topology to be and Z remesher isn't doing it. Z remesher does allow you to draw curves like guide curves for the remeshing and they work okay. But sometimes, for example, for a face, I might use Z remesher and it might get it 90% right. But then like there might be areas like around the eyes or the mouth where I might have to manually use something like Quadra and Maya um, or the topology, tool, topology tools in ZBrush to manually do that area. So Z remesher might give you like a really good head start. Now, let me just go inside here. I don't have the dude. How did I forget that? Sorry, let me go out to Maya for a second. I forgot to include my little guy from Maya. I'm going to make silly mistakes when streaming because I'm talking and my brain is uh, a little frazzled. And so I need this guy. So let me just call this scale ref dude because that's what he is. He helps me understand the scale of things. So I'm going to export him. So file export selection. He's going to be, I already have him here by himself, probably from last week. So I'm just going to export that again on top of itself. And let that let's get that inside here. So I'm going to have to load that dude in. And so and also I should save. So save as Archam ZBrush folder. That is our experiment that we did last week, where I just showed how to send over one object. But now we're doing it for real. So I'm just going to have this be the 8th of September, which is what I think it is. Yeah. And then I'm going to have it not be so long, underscore 001. So let me save the C tool. OK, now it's saved. And then as far as getting the dude in here, so I can sort of switch out of here to something else and then import under my data to ZBrush. There's the dude. So now the dude is in here. And then I'm going to go to my tool that has all of the geo. And then I'm going to append the dude and drag it back on. There he is. So you can now see if I alt click on him. There he is. So again, he's useful for scale because if he wasn't in here, you'd kind of have no idea if something is big or small or how it really relates to anything. So I highly recommend anytime you work on anything um, to give yourself something that tells you scale. It could be architecture, it could be a building, it could be a house, it could be a wheel, but you know, a character kind of makes sense. And this is just a scan of a person that's from a company called Render People. So that's what that is. All right. 
And now that I've got that, I'll just save my project again, because that's really the start port point that we want. And then now that we've done that, I'm going to alt click on the ground and now we can start sculpting on the ground. All right. Um, Bogdan, how do I solve zebra scaling issues when importing back from it? Um, yeah, I've definitely had scaling issues with ZBrush back and forth between Maya and ZBrush. And so some of the stuff I was talking about earlier in Maya, making sure that I freeze transform everything. So everything is zero, zero, zero on its translate and rotate settings in its correct position is one thing that I do before sending things to ZBrush. And then when I import things into ZBrush, like I just did with the guy, with the dude, if you noticed before importing them, I clicked on this PolyMesh 3D and imported it into that. And that's something that uh, also, for whatever weird voodoo reason, seems to also help solidify position and scale issues when on upon import. Because if they're imported correctly, they'll export correctly. And, uh, and that's a tip that I picked up from Pixelogic at some point, which was before importing something, instead of being like on the simple brush, uh, being on PolyMesh 3D. And uh, and that's another thing with starting in Maya and going to ZBrush is that that also helps. Um, and I just realized I've got this little unnecessary overlay. Sorry about that. So you can see the bottom of the window. Um, that also helps with uh, scale issues, I find. So I don't really have scale issues or scale problems when I follow those rules. It's just sometimes I might forget. And then obviously, if you start in ZBrush from scratch and just make like some random sphere, um, then you kind of really don't know what scale you're working at. And then you'll import into Maya and see it's like super tiny. So that's why it's good to like start in your DCC app, whether it's Maya or, or Blender, so that you know things are at the scale you want them to be. Um, Jacob, I'm working on the upcoming Avatar movies. I am not. And so I definitely know people that are. And uh, obviously, the production designers, uh, Dylan Cole and Ben Proctor, were both artists on the first Avatar. Um, and so Dylan and Ben were uh, designers, and Rob Stromberg was a production designer for uh, the first Avatar. And then Dylan and Ben were made the production designers for the Avatar sequels, which I think is amazing. So Dylan is a well-known matte painter, um, going back to Lord of the Rings and you know, going back over 20 years. And Ben has been in the industry since the 90s as well and worked at Digital Domain, I believe, for a very long time. So they're both amazingly cool guys and amazingly talented. So the fact that they're the production designers for the sequels, I think, is, is really, really cool. Um, but no, I am not working on the sequels. They're also really far. Like, they're, I think, Lightstorm. I guess they all have been online because of the pandemic or working from home. But uh, when I worked on it, it was at Lightstorm, which was in Santa Monica, which was already over like an hour and a half drive from where I live. Um, and now I believe it's Manhattan Beach where Lightstorm moved to. And that would be like in traffic over two hour drive. So it'd be a little far. Um, OK, sorry, need to figure out what I'm doing. All right, we're going to sculpt the ground. So there's things in here I don't need to be visible. So let me think what I do want to be visible and what I'm going to want to sculpt. Now for the ground, I'm not going to necessarily get too specific, but because it's going to end up being textured. Just let me think for a sec. Okay. First thing I probably want to do is I just want to smooth uh, these boulders that are in here or whatever they are, just so that they are more accurate as far as their intersection point with the ground. Because once these things get smooth, they're going to shrink. So let me just go inside here and go to the geometry. And let's subdivide these dudes. A little bit. So, not the most exciting thing to watch, but.
And since today is going to mostly be ZBrush, obviously, I totally understand if some of you are going to check out and come back later to see progress. Because I know it's not going to be the most exciting session, but hopefully I'm able to give some useful tips along the way. And once I subdivide these things, I need to adjust contact points on them. All right, I think that's all I need to worry about there. Okay, so you can see that now that I did that, <clears throat> it's not intersecting the ground. I'm just going to go to the move tool and just get this dude to intersect the ground. And once these are sculpted, their, you know, their shapes will change, but this is just a useful thing for me to do just for now. just not too exciting but easy how long did your zebra sculpts take on the creatures you worked on in avatar um well i wasn't doing that that was more neville so i shared an awful office with neville which was awesome neville page and so Neville was uh, in ZBrush. Uh, Tully Summers was learning ZBrush on Avatar and became amazing at it. And he sculpted a lot of stuff. Um, Yuri Bartoli was also sculpting creatures in ZBrush. He was primarily traditional, if I recall, at first. And then I believe started using ZBrush on Avatar. Um, so, but I did a lot of Maya stuff, uh, primarily. And so uh, I was in the creature department, but doing things like I'd get a sculpt from Neville that would need to be like, uh, it was before ZBrush had uh, Z Remesher. So I would have to like topologize things and rig them so that we could do animation tests and posing. So I would do that kind of stuff. So. Uh, Retopologizing, rigging, posing, look dev, materials, lighting, um, like that. But I wasn't, Neville was the lead creature designer, but basically between Neville and Yuri and Tully, as well as people at Legacy or Stan Winston's that also were doing that kind of stuff as well. Uh, Edison, for sure, height maps from ZBrush to use in substance is a very cool thing. I actually don't know substance. I've just, I've seen a lot of videos and we've had, you know, obviously no more workshop titles on it. But that's on the list of programs I want to learn. No, 
I actually think while I'm at it inside here, let's see. Instead of going straight to sculpting the ground, I'm just going to mess around some more. Okay, come on. We don't need you to be like that. With some objects and then probably start messing around a little bit with their silhouettes. And to do that, I will just subdivide some things a little bit further. Just to begin sort of making things not look like a bunch of eggs. And playing with the silhouettes on things is easy to do when they're fairly low res. So I'm really just, uh, let's try, let's see, that's going to help a little bit, maybe. Just adding a little bit of this sort of preview ambient inclusion on objects. Feeling inspired to make rocks, it's pretty relaxing. So, I mean, ultimately, I'll probably make final tweaks to silhouettes in Maya. But the overall shape of these things, you're just trying to make them look somewhat organic. And then whether they become like craggy or not, I can deal with once I start actually sculpting them. Because I will be doing actual sculpting on these things. It's just for now. All right, where is this guy? I'm going to just easier to see everything on this dude by hiding everything else. Make sure he's just intersecting. But yeah, I think, you know, part of these streams I was kind of uncomfortable with it at the beginning, but now like I, I think I, I care less because I think that it's important to see that, you know, I could just be playing in Unreal with Megascans assets and everything would look really pretty and final, but that's not really teaching you a lot. And that's something that would really just be doodling because I think that trying to create something from scratch, scratch, um, which still would end up, you know, in Unreal and still have maybe some Megascan stuff in there for set dressing, I think is just sort of more useful because, you know, if you have concept art that you need to match for an environment, you're going to have to kind of go through this process. Some things you're going to make yourself 
and some things you will be able to rely on scans. But you often, you know, knowing how to make rocks and boulders and cliffs and mountains and all that stuff yourself is a really good thing. And between, you know, scans to generate alphas, tools like Mixer and Substance, it's gotten a lot easier to get that stuff done. guy still right there got a little bit of moving I need to do on him Ibris sculpt. Can I show the new transparency shading? Um, I don't know what you're referring to, to be honest. Ben, I don't, I'm far from a ZBrush expert. That's where people on the uh, ZBrush streams are going to be more useful for that. Like uh, meaning like Joseph Drust and Paul Gabori, because you know Paul and Joseph who work for Pixelogic and some of the people that are on the ZBrush over at Pixelogic's Twitch streams, which they do all the time. I think you're more likely to get people who are like on the beta and know all the new stuff. So I'm that's my uh, unfortunate answer to you on that one. Ash Blossom. Some people want to do everything for themselves, but forget that when you're working, time is very limited, so scans are useful a lot of time. Oh, yeah, scans are amazing. And so, and I definitely have scans in my library. But again, more for set dressing than like blocking out an environment from scratch. And so, yeah, so things are going to go through this phase where everything just looks kind of blobby and kind of whatever, because I haven't dealt with any of the actual sculpting yet. But it still goes pretty fast. Sculptor, good night. I 
And then, yeah, this workflow, you know, just blocking things out in Maya and then sort of uh, sculpting them in ZBrush um, is a workflow that, uh, you know, I've used on a lot of different projects, just so you have, you know, something as a reference point. Like, let's say I go out to, let's see, I guess I can go to my, what do I have a link for here? If I jump over to the link for where's my art station page, there it is. Just so you kind of have an idea of like where we're going. So like <clears throat> things like, uh, I don't have, there we go, like this guy. So like the workflow we're using right now is what I use to make this image in a lot of environments, meaning that it eventually ends up being detailed. It's just uh, right now we're going through the block out. This was blocked out also in Maya, the way we did it. Um, everything sent over to ZBrush everything kind of blocked out as we're doing right now. And then the detail that you see that makes things look rocky comes via sculpting with alphas, sculpting manually, and then texturing. Um, and so ultimately the intent will be to have this be an environment that is detailed like this. Um, we're just going through the early stages of it. I just feel like I need to give disclaimers sometimes. I guess because I'm self-conscious when things are going through the uh, kind of ugly phase or the boring looking phase. Jacob, from industry projects I've been in, what helped you me the most from my leads? Um, well, I think, you know, leads serve two purposes, um, which should be the same as a teacher, you know, uh, at school. A lead is really going to be able to offer both tech support with tools um, while also being able to offer you art direction. And so helping you understand how to solve problems is really the purpose of a lead or a supervisor. So making sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, that it's matching the art direction that they have from their supervisor, which could be the production designer or the art director. And so often, you know, people go from being artists to becoming leads uh, becoming supervisors. And so they have experience doing the work themselves. Usually will have more time on the box than you. And that's where they'll be able to help you approach things as efficiently as possible. Which is super useful when you're a junior, of course, because then you might not know the fastest way to approach something or the way that that particular studio might want things done. So I'd say, you know, getting advice from those around you is awesome. And it's how you really pick up clever ways of approaching problems. And so that ultimately, you know, for the many years that I taught at Noman, because I, you know, I taught at Noman, you know, I haven't taught for the last few years, been just busy with other Noman stuff. So I think I haven't taught since like 2017 ish, or maybe it was 2018. Um, but for all the time I did, that was basically my role is that's, you know, somebody would have something to do based on concept art 
and basically saying, here's how I would approach this. This is the tools I would use. This is the workflow I would use just to basically get them going in a direction and then sort of check in to see how that's going and ask answer any questions that they might have, whether it's technical or whether it's art direction, meaning from texturing, modeling, lighting, compositing. Um, and these are going to be very different depending on the kind of studio you work on. So it's, it's, you know, that's why I can only use my own. advice there. You can see I'm using the move tool, by the way, a lot as opposed to sculpting. I find it uh, really efficient. Uh, Ash Blossom. Yeah, as far as Maya goes, because you know, Maya came out in 98, and so it's been out for a long time. Back then, a lot of game studios were using 3ds Max, and over the years, that's transitioned over to Maya being more of like the entertainment tool and Max being more like ArcViz and that space. So yeah, a lot of the industry, whether it's games or visual effects, transitioned to Maya as being sort of like the main hub of their pipeline. So the sort of market penetration of Maya is very, very high. So you will see places using auxiliary tools like ZBrush for sculpting or Houdini for effects, but it's very common to see Maya as like the hub. Meaning everything's kind of like using that as the uh, sort of final assembly happening in Maya. And then for tools like, you know, game pipeline let's say using an engine whether it's unreal or an in-house engine you know unreal while they've been adding a lot of stuff to it it still doesn't have things like rigging or you know the modeling tools are very basic compared to something like maya so not to say there aren't other tools out there that are awesome whether it's blender or cinema or whatever so so it's not a matter of like which program is better like people like to get into that argument, which is kind of pointless. I think it's more of like, well, where do you want to work? What tools do they use? Learn that. Because really, I mean, you're going to, it's not like you can go and get into an argument with like, you know, the pipeline TDs at ILM and tell them that they should use Blender. It's like, they're using what they're using. They have good reasons. And if you want to work at ILM, it probably makes more sense to learn Maya than to argue the fact that Blender is great. It's like Blender is great. But, you know, it's uh, once you know a tool, learning another one is a lot easier. So. Let's save. I haven't saved in too long. Uh, yeah, what a digital and side effects have announced what a H, what also announced what a M, which is for Maya. And uh, yeah, it's awesome. So you may be aware, but you know, certain tools have come out of studios. So like Massive, the crowd sim software was developed for Lord of the Rings. So those huge battles in Fellowship of the Ring. Um, Massive was developed internally at ILM and then eventually became a product that people could buy. Same thing with Mari. Same thing with Nuke, which was developed a digital domain. Um, so a lot of tools have that kind of history. And uh, so the fact that Weta is now going to be releasing a lot more of their pipeline tools is pretty cool. You know, XGen, which is in Maya, came from Disney. 
So yeah, the, the history of software is uh, pretty commonly based on internal development. Like some of the tools that are in Maya were developed internally at a place called Santa Barbara Studios back in the 90s, who developed advanced visualizer and explore and dynamation, kinemation, all these 3D tools that aren't around anymore because they all got bought by Silicon Graphics, which then bought Alias, and then that all got merged into what is now Maya. Uh, yep, yeah, Adobe has invested in Blender, but everybody's invested in Blender. Epic has invested in Blender. Studios have invested in Blender. It's in everybody's interest for there to be a competitive landscape, especially for studios, but also for software companies, you know. And uh, so I think that the future of Blender is definitely very bright. And I think that because it's free, anybody who's interested in learning 3D, getting started with Blender makes the most sense because it's free. And for things like modeling, it's very easy to jump to another program. You know, things like rigging and effects, that's more of an issue. Duncan Brinsmead, man, that is a name that just brings back memories of SIGGRAPH and the alias user group meetings. Duncan, I'm pretty sure, is still at Autodesk because obviously they acquired alias where he was the sort of principal scientist. But waiting for Duncan's demos at SIGGRAPH every year to see what new tools for Power Animator he would show, well, those were very exciting days. SIGGRAPH in the 90s was amazingly cool. SIGGRAPH today, a little less so because, you know, the internet kind of had a big impact on trade shows like that. But SIGGRAPH in the 90s, before the internet really took hold as the place to release products, <clears throat> was nuts. So many people, huge booths, big parties. It was really, really cool. But yeah, Duncan was always so inspiring it was unique because he was a programmer but he was also an artist i believe he went to juilliard um so to have those type of people are really rare you know people that you know like ofer alon the guy who who created zbrush and is still the owner and chief programmer for zbrush he's also an artist and those, it's rare to have somebody who is a very very talented artist while also being able to develop tools and when you get those rare people, you obviously, they're able to understand not just how to make a tool, but why, because they're making it for themselves as well. Uh, when will ILM release StageCraft as a product or service? That I don't know. I saw some videos where they were talking about it in re re relation to the Mandalorian, obviously. 
for virtual production. <clears throat> but I know that ILM is also using Unreal. And so I'm curious like what the relationship is between Stagecraft and uh, Unreal at ILM. I do not know. Rise of real time is clearly the topic of the day. Meaning real time in applications like animation, visual effects, virtual production, you know, on stage backgrounds. It's pretty cool. I know this is getting really redundant, and so I totally understand if you're like, I think I'm going to go watch something else. I won't take it personally. But I'm just going to have to get through all these objects, just sort of block out shapes before I start sculpting on them. Pixel Venture. You understand Stagecraft is layer on top of Unreal. User interface is more virtual production focused versus, okay. Cool. Yeah, I mean, it seems that Epic is investing, you know, so much money into developing Unreal as a virtual production tool um, with each new release, especially the new one, 427, uh, having that be as a primary target for the new features in 427. So it seems like it obviously would make the most sense for them to be collaborating. Because Epic, you know, compared to most software companies, just has so much money, you know, because of Fortnite and obviously what they make from Unreal, what they make from their games. And so most software companies don't have that kind of, you know, hundred million dollars a month or whatever they're making off Fortnite. So which is awesome because a percentage of that is getting developed or you know funneled into tool development. And so I think that's where we're gonna see some pretty exciting things coming, like Unreal 5. Like I'm curious, like if, if Fortnite wasn't a success, like, you know, things would be different. So it's just so awesome that not only was Fortnite a success, but that Epic is using a lot of that money to do really cool stuff. Uh, AG, I think personal work is important for that. You know, like once you start, that's what I, I mentioned that earlier that like, I think that when you're, you know, when you're a student, you get to do a lot of personal stuff, but you can't wait to get a job. And then you get a job and you kind of realize that now it's harder to do personal stuff because, you know, you're busy 40 or 50 hours a week working. And so, uh, but, you know, uh, using, you know, if 3D is really your passion and it really is what you love to do as not just a job, but as a hobby, then that's where you know, hopefully personal work is something that you can integrate into your routine in your evenings and weekends. Um, and there's a lot of artists out there like Raf Grissetti, um, who obviously has a full-time job at Sony as the art director. I forget his exact title, but you know, uh, at Sony Santa Monica for God of War. And uh, that guy produces so much personal work, it's crazy. And he has kids, you know, young kids. It's very inspiring. It's amazing. And, and I think that's where you can utilize your personal work as an opportunity to learn new tools and learn new techniques and, you know, develop your portfolio in addition to what you do at work for fun. And then that might open up new opportunities for you outside of that job. Meaning that if you have a job that you like, but you maybe 
rather do something different, then the work that you're doing at that studio might not be the type of work that you want to have in your reel for your next gig and personal work can help you with that as well. So if you can, you know, how I say going to school is useful to have a community of people around you that are like-minded. Um, you know, what I see is that, you know, you develop a community through school, through online, through discord, through whatever, and, and let that community motivate you, you know, and keep you on your toes. So I remember back a few years ago, um, when I was hanging out a bit with people in cinematics at Blizzard, and it was a time where there were some, you know, pretty, you know, there, obviously there are a lot of rock stars at Blizzard still, but back then it was like Fausto Di Martini and Vitali Bulgarov and Jonathan Berube and uh, David Lesbrance and Alvaro Buendia. There were, there were just like these incredibly talented people in cinematics. Um, at that time, all those people have left since, but obviously there's now people at Blizzard that are also super, super awesome. But back then, I was hanging out with some of those people quite a bit. And, uh, and something that I found interesting was that even though Fausto and Vitali and Barubi were so talented and successful and, uh, you know, um, good positions at Blizzard, they would meet like every Sunday to basically discuss what they were working on in their free time, what they were doing personally to just motivate each other and keep each other on point, whether it was, you know, uh, books they were reading, um, new techniques they were exploring or software or tools. And then they would, you know, get together every Sunday, discuss that stuff. And then every Sunday, basically, like, did you do what you said you were going to do over the last week um, in your with your personal work. So they would kind of like keep each other in check, motivate each other. And I thought it was really interesting that these artists who were already so good and successful um, felt this constant need to continually improve. And, uh, and it was through using their friends to help keep them motivated that they were able to uh, get a lot of stuff done. So if you can find a group, obviously, we would all love to have Vitali and Fausto in our like friend group that we hang out with on Sundays. But the point being is it doesn't matter who it is, as long as you're hanging out with people that are motivated and passionate, as opposed to people who are doing what you wish you did less of. If that makes any sense. You know, like if you feel like I spend too much time playing video games, but all your friends just sit on the couch and play video games and aren't the people that you wish you were then, you know, who you surround yourself with makes a really, really, really big difference. All right, well, I've pretty much touched everything that's inside here, except for, all right, there's still that dude. Sometimes ZBrush's way of navigating things is so wonky. Ash, uh, you were anxious to get started, but focusing on getting good and making what I want and enjoying the time I have. And after that, focusing on getting a job. That's really 
the way the best way to focus on it just have a good time you will get better you know time goes by you'll get better and at that point eventually you'll get good enough that you can get a job and that is how it goes the amount of time it takes depends on what you want to do it depends on how much time you have per week to focus on it again who you surround yourself with but you just have to and the time smooth this because in my effort to be efficient I did something funny on that and I'm gonna I'm gonna just do with alphas I'm not gonna worry about that okay that's enough of that all right so now the last piece I'm gonna mess with just looks like a bunch of pillows just creating this soft little family of pillows is what it looks like not the final intent obviously Edison, for me, one less per week and an output per week, which is solid. That's a goal. I think that's a smart pace. You know, don't try and learn too many things at the same time. You know, like get comfortable with, like, don't try to like learn Maya while you're learning Houdini, while you're learning Blender, you know. So from a software perspective, just try and get comfortable. If As long as you just have one main DCC app like Blender or Maya, I think as a junior, there's no reason to know more than once one. Ace, thank you. Bob Ross, indeed. Some documentary just came out about Bob Ross. Which I have not seen. Although supposedly, I think I read the family wasn't too happy about it. All right, enough of all that. So now I guess I'm going to play with the ground a little bit. Yeah, it's 3.30 already. And then for the ground, I'm going to be sculpting as opposed to what I've been doing, which is the move tool. So we're going to switch up tools. But I think before I do that, let's see, I'm going to go to some tool. Actually, no, I don't need to do that. Yeah, we'll sculpt. Um, but I am going to, since we're at the halfway point, uh, get myself another drink. So we're going to take a quick break. Uh, while we take the break, I'll just sh show you guys a video. I haven't shown it on the stream yet today, so I've been showing it on the other streams, um, which is that short that I made uh, on in the Unreal Fellowship. It's like three minutes long, so it's long enough for me to like go grab more coffee and come back. But again, it's uh, I did the Unreal Fellowship back in May, which ended at the end of June, where it was a crash course in Unreal, and we had to make a short in five weeks, and uh, where I 
came up with an idea, designed an environment, built the environment, Maya, ZBrush, like we're doing here, Mixer, Unreal. And then I used a lot of assets from Marketplace and Mega Scans, like the character and a lot of rocks and props and things uh, to flesh out the environment. And, uh, and it was really, really fun. And, uh, and hopefully what we're doing in ZBrush right now will eventually end up in Unreal. So I'm going to play that. Again, it's like three minutes long. And uh, so it's just a little break for me to just go grab another drink. And first, save. I right hear bagpipes. All right, so I'm going to play that video and then I'll be back. If I can find where the button is to play that video. There it is. All right, I'll be back. Hello. Got myself another drink. And now we're going to keep working. So I'm going to hide everything except for the ground and the dude. Let's see, what are we going to do? So I'm going to sculpt. So I'm going to use clay buildup. And I'm going to switch over to my tablet. And hope that it's working. All right, it's not mapped correctly. So I'm going to fix that first. Um, Scampi, uh, thank you. Um, 
Dottie Matrix, how long was the production for that? Uh, that was, the fellowship was five weeks. Uh, it took me the first couple of weeks to come up with the idea. Um, and so, and storyboard it and uh, and design it. And then, so it was about three weeks to make it, um, which I think is, a, you know, in the end, a testament to how awesome Unreal is. Because obviously, since it's in Unreal, it's all real time. And so uh, the fact that that whole that thing is three minutes long and HD and it rendered in about three minutes, maybe five, is just insane. It's so awesome. All right, so I'm just changing my mapping to my tablet. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so it was about three weeks. Um, uh, Pixel Venture, is there a way to purchase Nomen t-shirts, hats online? Um, I mean, we're reopening and the store is reopening. So um, that's something that has to be done on campus. And so we've talked about putting that online before, but uh, but for now you'd have to have to call. And I'm not sure if you could order off over the phone though. So. Um, but I just call the, the main line and see. Um, how did I come to 3D? What was my key moment in life? Um, for 3D, it was two things. 1993, it was Jurassic Park and the release of Myst, the video game. I think those are the things that made me realize that I wanted to do it um, or learn how to do it. Before that, it was these things called the mind's eye. And uh, I mean, I don't know if I can, let me see if I can show you guys, because I don't know, you guys are mostly probably too young to remember these. Are they on? Yeah, they're on, they're on YouTube. Don't want to In this tutorial, we're going to be color. No. So here we go. So I'm just opening up YouTube. Skip. So Beyond the Mind's Eye I forget, came out, you can see 1992. So these were like VHS tapes that you could buy. And I came across them and bought one. And uh, it's basically like early 90s and 80s CG. And I guess I'm not going to play the audio. I guess I can play the audio. The essence of your imagination. I don't know if you guys can hear the audio. Look within your dreams. They can take you beyond the mind's eye. Dude, so this is 19... I'm going to pause the... Uh, stop the audio. This is 1992. So, you know, CG back then and the tools used to do this stuff were primarily Silicon Graphics based. But anyway, I saw this VHS tape and it completely blew my mind and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world, but it didn't really have a lot of information about like how these things were made. And this is before the internet. So I saw these tapes and I thought this stuff was really, really cool. Um, and then the following year, 93, Mist came out and I learned that Mist was made on a Mac by two brothers and then Jurassic Park came out. So for me, 92, 93 is when I discovered 3D and got super excited about it. And uh, so I'd recommend going on YouTube and, you know, you can see it's 49 minutes long. If you just want to see what was considered state-of-the-art CG in the early 90s, they're pretty entertaining. I'm just going to skip whatever's playing right there. And uh, so, yeah, so Mist came out. Mist was made with a program called, uh, yeah, Pixel Venture. I agree. It totally looks like NFT stuff. Um, Mist was made in a program called Strata, but Strata was really expensive. And so um, so I got a Mac and here, let me start working and then I'll be able to talk while working. So I just got to figure out what I'm going to do inside here. Let's see. I'm going to just have some stuff be visible. Let me 
that. Yeah, there's some of those. I'm just deciding what I want to be visible. So yeah, so I found a program called Infinity. And Infinity was also on the Mac, but it was a lot cheaper. And uh, so I started learning Infinity. And then Infinity was uh, really limited, but it was still really cool. And then once I kind of learned everything, it was a really small program. Once I kind of felt like I learned what there was to learn about Infinity and I wanted to do more, there was a program called Electric Image, which was also on the Mac. And uh, I got a hold of that, bought a used copy. And then around that time, I decided to that I really need to learn SGIs um, and the software that was on the SGIs, like Alias. And it was like a hundred grand. So that's when I went to art school because I couldn't afford the software. And then the art school I went to had the computers. So yeah, that's how I got into 3D. Babylon 5, that's awesome. That was Lightwave. Lightwave was like the program for CG and TV shows back in the 90s. Ed Catmull, for sure. So I'm going to start with just sort of sculpting basic stuff. Just using clay tubes or a clay built up. Because <clears throat> the main thing is I just don't want the ground to be totally smooth, even though it might get textured and could even have a displacement map. I just want to break it up so that there's just like a undulation to it. And so and this will all get smoothed out and retopoed. Diligent, that's awesome. VHS tapes, that's where it started. It's like struggling to try and get software interfaces onto 640 by 480 VHS tapes was surprisingly tricky. It was all this, like now anybody can make a tutorial as we see on YouTube and whatever, thanks to programs like Camtasia, which is awesome. But back then it was such a pain like all the hardware you needed to be able to do PHS tutorials. But it was exciting at the same time. You know, I'm just going to have everything visible.
Now, one thing is a good idea with this kind of stuff is reference, obviously. Like pulling up reference of creeks or rivers just to sort of like see what kind of shapes I could put in here that I might not think of intuitively because I haven't maybe done them enough. You know, you tend to repeat shapes that you've made before. And if you want to do something different, you should really look at reference. Um, and so for that, you know, I think for this, I'm just going to mess around and sculpt. But if I was going to do a search, I'd probably go on Google for a while and just search for streams rocky streams and just to get ideas for what kind of shapes I could use. And again, this is going now from like the soft pillow blob look into ultimately a very rough getting overall shapes for all these things done. And then after all of that, then we'll start to detail with alphas. So it's a process. But you can be a lot more random with organic stuff than you can with, let's say, characters or creatures that need to follow very specific um, anatomy cues whether it's human or reptile or bird or fish. But nature has its own anatomy because there's different kinds of rocks, different kinds of soil, you know, like sandstone versus granite. Sandstone's very soft. So you get things like Arches National Park, which has very different shapes than because the sandstone gets carved by water a lot easier than let's say granite does. And you get really, really cool shapes in places like in, in Utah specifically, there's a lot of sandstone there. But for this, I'm just doing something rocky-ish. And what you'll see is if I just open Lightbox real quick and I go into my alphas that I have, I've got a lot of alphas, which I've shown before. <clears throat> so I've got like all of these alphas that I've made off of scans, which are all very like rocky alphas that we'll get into later. And then I've got these kind of alphas that are really useful for detailing different types of rocky shapes, whether it's things that are you know, layered like sandstone, things that are cracked, things that are fractured. And so these are all things that I'll end up using once I block out the original sculpt. I don't want to get into alphas now. Um, I'm just dealing with overall form and overall shapes. Demetrius Strata, I think, was out for the Amiga also, and they use it for commercials. Oh, for sure, because that was really where these 3D programs were used back in the early 90s. As far as, you know, things on the SGI were primarily used for uh, industrial design. That's where Alias came from, you know, places like Ford and GM. Um, and then the visual effects industry started using those tools in the early 90s with Jurassic Park. Um, but tools like Strata and Infinity, yeah, it was since the SGI programs were way too expensive for most people to use, then the tools that were on personal computers like Strata are what you would see things like bumpers on, you know, TV commercials. So they didn't look as good as what you were seeing in movies because the tools at that time, the difference between what you could get on a personal computer versus a workstation was huge.
Yazzie Max, alumni here. Hello. Any plan on going all out with an amazing gallery featured artist when reopening the campus? Well, uh, we have a new show in the gallery that went up last month, which is a student show. And so that's uh, brand new, relatively speaking. Um, uh, all printed by ArtStation as the last couple shows. So it's on the really cool metal prints that ArtStation does. So uh, ArtStation has been printing our gallery shows for a little while, which is really, really nice of them. And because uh, I've been friends with those dudes forever. And uh, so if you are in LA and can swing by Noman, I know we have a lot of COVID protocols and you have to obviously call first and all that stuff. But that's the current gallery show. And so at this point, it's hard to say because we can't do like a big gallery event like we used to do just yet because of COVID. Um, can't wait until we can. And so in the meantime, so I'm not sure what the next show will be after that. It might be another student show in January. Usually we do at least six shows a year, but obviously COVID affected that. I just swallowed my drink the wrong way. <laughs> Why do our bodies let us do that? That is the strangest thing to breathe and eat out of the same tube. Um, if I had to specialize in industry, for example, groomer, hard surface, what would it be? That really depends on what you like, you know? And so, because Obviously, there's people who love rigging and there's people who don't. And there's people who love texturing and there's people who don't. So for me, I'm a generalist, meaning I like everything. Um, over the years, I've done everything from rigging effects. I mean, back in the day, back, you know, in the early days of the Nomen Workshop, I think I had like 14 dynamic effects titles that I did for the workshop. Um, so I'm a big fan of kind of like all the different aspects of production um for the most part but when you're trying to get a job you have to find the thing that you love doing and uh being like a jack of all trades is good but it's dangerous like you need to be really good at one of those things to be able to get a job doing it so that's why the idea of like being jack of all trades master of one is a good idea So you might be somebody who, you know, can model and texture or you can rig and animate. All right, now all of that was just blocking shapes <clears throat> on the ground. It's all gonna get smoothed out now. And so I'm gonna smooth it out, but there's a couple ways to do that. So let me see this thing, cause this thing is like 1.2 million polys. And the topology right now doesn't, you know, sort of follow the sculpt at all. So I'll probably end up retopologizing it a couple times. But the first thing I'm going to do is just uh, hide everything. So I can see the part of the geometry that actually got sculpted. And then I'm just going to 
sculpt a little bit of random stuff beyond that border just for where it's intersecting with things. And then when I retopologize it, my I won't need as many polygons. And the new mesh that I get um, will be smooth because it's not going to be that many polys. So like all the little brush marks that I see inside here will go away. AVT Pro. Oh, that's awesome. Lanker. Oh my God. I haven't heard that word in a while. Yeah, I've got a copy of that book too somewhere. So many moons ago. But yeah, Lan Lanker was a popular character for a while. Nerbs patch modeling. Ooh, before ZBrush. Making characters was tough. That's awesome that you've been doing this stuff for that long. Um, Mike May Art. Well, something that's interesting is like, you know, there's programs like, you know, Substance Painter and, um, and ZBrush where, you know, you can start to combine concepting with 3D, with texturing. It's all sort of starting to fuse where 3D is becoming a bigger, bigger part of like, you know, pretty much all pipelines. So hopefully you'll be able to do more texturing. All right, so I'm gonna read top of this thing. <clears throat> so it's 1.2 million polys. So if I go down to SDiv1, these are just the polys, you know, the mesh as it was from, you know, Z remeshing it earlier. Um, but I don't want to lose all of the information that I sculpted. I just want um, this to be smoothed out, but have the general forms of what I sculpted. And so at 1.2 million, it's fine. It's really, as far as how smooth it's going to be, it's going to be a matter of the polygon count I tell Z Remesher to remesh this to. Now, before I hit Z Remesher, I want to check to see, like, do I really need it to be 1.2 million polygons? Because the more polys this is, the longer it's going to take to remesh. So if I go down a level, I'm just going to see if it like kind of looks the same. I mean, it does kind of look the same at 300,000. So that's probably fine. So I'm going to go down a level and delete higher. So now this thing is only 300,000 polys. And now I'm going to Z remesh it. And so, but instead of remeshing it down to just 5,000, which would be a little low, because if I go to SDiv1, this thing is 5,000, but that's not a lot of polygons. So I probably am going to have the target polygon count be 20 or 20,000. And let's see what we get. I'm going to hit the remesher, but first I'm going to save. Don't forget to do that. Obviously there's the auto save, but I like to do my own. Yeah, I was, uh, I mean, also back then, like when I had the 14 dynamics titles, you know, VHS tapes and DVDs could only be two hours. These days, you know, we can make a six hour title. So you don't, wouldn't need to be so many. All right, so I'm going to hit Z remesh at 20,000 polys. So since this mesh is only 300,000, you know, shouldn't take that long. So there you go. So now I have basically my ground geometry. 
Um, so you can see I got rid of all those brush strokes that I didn't that you know made it look really sloppy. But now, you know, you can see what the topology looks like for this terrain or the ground. So it's enough information so that at least the ground inside here, you know, looks organic and terrain like. Um, and it's fairly optimized just because the topology is following the form and the shapes that I sculpted. Um, and then now I can keep sculpting on it. So really the sculpting I was doing with clay tubes or clay buildup was just to get overall shapes in. And now this thing is only 18,000 polys. So it's not, you know, that heavy. Um, and so as far as what I'm going to do next on it, the question is whether I start to detail this at this point or if I move on to some of the other objects and do the same thing prior to detailing. But I think I'll play with play with the ground a little bit more. So, which means I'm now going to divide this again. So now that this is 300,000, I can kind of see what it looks like smoothed. And I'm going to get everything else back. Um, so yeah, so it's an easy way to kind of smooth things out. Because if I had smoothed it all out using the smooth uh, brush, it would have like melted away all of the form changes that I had done. But by smoothing it out with Z remesher, I kind of get to keep all of that stuff. Um, okay. And so now I can basically keep sculpting. But now I might sculpt with different tools. I'm just trying to decide how hard of an edge I want on the little stream, which I might not actually want. Because I'm also aware that I'm going to texture this thing in Mixer, most likely. And so I don't really need to get into high frequency detail. It's really tempting to do that in ZRush. But then if I do high frequency sculpting inside here, and then I'd need like a normal map, it becomes a problem. Because if the camera is going to be really too close to the ground, you really kind of want a tiling texture on the ground so that it's not going to be too low res. Um, on the part of the ground that's near the camera. And so that's why I really want to focus on what I'm going to do with geometry. So the more sculpting that I do, uh, the heavier the geo is going to be for the ground. So right now it's 300,000 polys. So that's okay, especially if I end up remeshing it again. So I'm just going to go in here and Oh, you know, it might be kind of fun to play with some alphas in here. Yeah. You know what? I think I'm just going to move on sculpting some of these rocks. I don't know why that keeps popping up. All right, I need to move this dude out of the way. I don't want to keep them in here. Where's the manipulator? All 
Uh, you can go over there. Blender Terrain Mixer. Not familiar with that. All right, so I'm just going to start with the Move Tool. And then I'm going to do the same thing that we did with the ground, but I'll sculpt it with clay tubes. Or clay balled up. I used to use clay tubes all the time, so that's why I keep saying that. Okay, you need to be subdivided a few times now. Okay, you don't need to be that heavy. And again, all the roughness that we see from stro strokes and stuff will go away once I retop it. So it's just making generic boulder shape. Uh, I didn't do any environment stuff on Avatar. I was in the creature department. So I was on Avatar in 2006. So it was uh, so back then I was really just interested in character creature stuff. Um, I didn't get into doing environment stuff until after Avatar. Because like when I was got into 3D, doing like heavy environments with lots of polygons was kind of not something computers were great at dealing with and then a lot of things whether it's graphics cards cpus ram uh proxies being added to tools like mental ray and then v-ray and redshift uh, made it possible to handle massive polygon counts and so once you could do terrains that had billions of polygons is when i got interested in doing uh environment stuff um because just like a single hero tree from a program like Speed Tree can be, you know, 300,000 polys. And so that's where um, prior to being able to handle those polygon counts, it was pretty painful to do like heavy environments. And then you can see in here, like if I just, you know, like I did with the ground, if I take something like this rock thing, boulder, and I go to Z remesher on it, this thing is 50,000 
polys. And so if I now just uh, remesh it and just have the target be five, Uh, AVT Pro, did I set up any characters for their motion builder pipeline? Uh, no, because the motion builder stuff was going on in the stage for all the mocap that was going on in Playa Vista. And uh, so it was more high res creatures, uh, ZBrush, Maya, going on in the art department. All right, so now you can see that this thing, now that I retopped it, you know, pretty quick to just get it from being a sphere shape to being something that feels like an organic, uh, generic boulder. And then obviously this thing will get textured and that's where all the high frequency detail will come from. But you can see that on this guy, that the topology, you know, now follows the shape and the form. So out of 5,000 polygons, it's, you know, basically capturing the silhouette and I still might work on it more, but I don't need to spend more than that much time on any one of these until I kind of have things blocked out. And then I'll start playing with how these things fit together and trying to make things look more intentional. And obviously once I get into Unreal, I'll be able to, you know, move things around and rotate them and copy these and I just rewatched uh, all of the extended editions of Lord of the Rings. And uh, obviously there's a lot of behind the scenes on those, but watching them, the behind the scene appendix that discusses uh, them building Shelob's lair and building um, Minas Tirith. It's crazy. Those sets, just like what I'm doing in ZBrush, just like sculpting rocks, just seeing them build these huge sets and carving rocks out of foam just like how amazing they end up looking and it's all just car hand carved foam hand painted obviously time consuming i think they said they had like a hundred people building minas Tirith set All right, so this rocky thing is all right. I'm going to put that not to be so round. And then get everything back. And I'm going to retop that shape. So remesh it. Just to write the story to the movie. Yeah, I don't know how long they worked on the screenplay, but those movies are just absolutely Freaking amazing.
Uh, I haven't seen that yet. But I'll definitely be watching that soon. So, yeah, I made a ton of money last weekend. But yeah, I obviously on Facebook saw lots of people sharing stuff about that. Sometimes my pressure sensitivity gets weird. I have to minimize the brush for it to wake up. So, very weird. Don't know why that happens, but it's been like that. Yeah, watching me sculpt rocks and boulders is probably not all that interesting, but it's going to end up probably being, you know, a day of sculpting for this environment. <clears throat> and then another day of texturing. So next week, I guess, is when we'll get into texturing. But the nice thing is once I have all these rocks and boulders, I can reuse them on other projects, you know, in the future. So just they just get added to my library. And then obviously I'm not worried about things like stretching polygons because it's gonna get retopoed. Tips on how to stay focused and not procrastinate. For a lot of people, doing not doing stuff alone is useful. Meaning that if you're in school and you, instead of trying to do all your work at home, go to the lab and hang out and sit next to somebody who is not procrastinating, sit next to somebody who's working their ass off and doing impressive work, that'll motivate you. It's hard to stay motivated if you're alone. So again, letting other people help is a good idea. And if you can get that same experience online through Discord and stuff like that, but everybody procrastinates. And so it's just a matter of making sure that the times that you are productive, um, you know, you're getting done what you want and that maybe the things that you use to procrastinate are things that at least fill your head with useful stuff. Like, you know, if you're into game environments and you procrastinate by playing games that have environments in them that you wish you could make, at least that's going to be inspiring you as opposed to going on, you know, online and watching like, you know, masterclass lectures where they don't really teach you anything or watching things like, you know, friends i mean what you're not going to really learn anything watching friends that have to do with building environments or creatures or characters so but you know if you're spending your procrastination time watching the stuff that you want to do then hopefully will inspire you
Uh, yeah, I usually um, have music playing. Not my uh, Twitch safe fantasy music playlist, though, because that's obviously for Twitch. There's a limit to what I can play, supposedly. So, uh, yeah. Although, actually, this music is pretty relaxing. But, yeah, I definitely have a, <clears throat> you know, ton of different types of music that I like. So I pretty much always will have music playing, especially when I'm in uh, doing 3D stuff. I find it hard to like have music playing when I'm doing work work, like emails and corresponding and all that kind of stuff. But for being in 3D, for sure. Usually instrumental stuff. All right, so this guy can get retopped. Um, ABT Pro, is there a low poly way to populate forests on mountain hillsides, or is it covered in your PaintFX tree and plant tutorial? Um, well, yeah, I mean, you would use proxies. And a proxy is like a low-res object that can later be replaced with a high-res object. Um, and so through using proxies in programs like uh, V-Ray or Redshift, that's basically, there's a lot of tools to populate objects or scatter objects across surfaces. There's things like uh, MASH in Maya or the foliage tool in Unreal. And those allow you to very interactively, uh, procedurally replicate objects across the surface, or you can use them to um, paint objects on a surface. Um, and then it's very easy using tools like Ash or XGen um, to replace the objects with something else. So you could start with low res objects and then swap them out with high res objects. And I think I might have missed a couple comments. So I'm just going to scroll up just to see. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, the behind the scenes. Yeah, the bigatures, small miniatures. Uh, image junkie, you noticed Noman is a Houdini certified school. Does that mean you will be adding more Houdini classes? Um, I mean, we've been adding more Houdini classes over the years. Um, we have our entire effects track now, which is Maya and Houdini centric. So we have quite a few Houdini classes. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, our effects curriculum for the full-time programs is pretty thorough. Um, but I would say more classes for Houdini will definitely be coming. Um, did I draw the layout first? No, I didn't. We blocked it out in Maya, so I just uh, did the layout design in Maya last week. Dalek, what am I doing? Building an environment from scratch that started in Maya. Now we're in ZBrush. We're going to sculpt it in here. Then we're going to end up in Unreal, but probably not for a week or two. Um, You are debating signing up for a 3D art school. Do you recommend getting into 3D first, even if your end goal is concept art? Um, well, 3D is everywhere. So I don't think you can get around not learning 3D now, even as a concept artist. And so whether you look at people like Tali Bulgarov or Yama Jurabev or, you know, I mean, pretty much everybody is doing 3D now. You will pretty much find that uh, whether it's the art department at, you know, Blizzard or ILM or Weta, ZBrush and 3D and 3D printing, all this stuff is here to stay. <clears throat> so I think learning 3D is something that if you want to get into concept art, you're going to have to learn. Um, whether you should learn 3D prior to going to art school, I would say sure. I mean, like play with something like Blender, you know, just to see if you like 3D. Because the reality is, is that, you know, there are people out there that, um, just want to draw, but it's increasingly difficult to find full-time positions 
um, at studios where you can just be using traditional media. They, it's pretty much expected that everything is digital now just because it's faster. And there's so many powerful tool now, tools now for designing in 3D. So you need a strong 2D foundation. And then on top of that, the 3D tools help you visualize your ideas faster. Even if a lot of concept artists are now blocking things out in 3D and then doing paint overs, for example, in Photoshop. So I would say definitely, you know, learn a tool like Blender, see if you like 3D tools. At first, you're going to probably find them frustrating because the learning curve is a thing. You know, certain tools take less time to learn than others, especially, let's say, tools that, uh, you know, like something like ZBrush, where you can see the number of tools that I've been using today isn't that many. So the interface of ZBrush is weird and bugs a lot of people in the beginning, but you'll get used to it. But ZBrush is obviously a big one from a concepting pers perspective, especially for characters and creatures. Hopefully you can see in here with like the sculpting that we've done on some of these, you know, rocks. I'm making weird shapes just because it's more fun and it'll end up influencing the environment I make. But, you know, being able to, you know, make these yourself as opposed to where obviously if I had concept art, I would be following the concept art is something that's uh, a fun thing to do. Um, I would definitely recommend doing this stuff, you know, from reference trying to copy shapes that you're seeing in nature so that those shapes end up sort of sticking in your head, um, which I've done a bit of, but not enough of, because I don't think you can ever do enough of that kind of stuff. And then since assets can be reused, instead of going and buying model libraries, build your own model libraries. From getting a job, that's obviously a lot more useful to show a scene or an environment and if somebody says, how did you make this? And you said, I, say, I made everything. That's more likely to get you a job than to show an environment. And if they say, how did you make it? You say, I bought a bunch of, you know, kit bash libraries online and that's how I assembled it. Cause then at that point, you're more of a layout artist. You know, you're focusing on composition and scene assembly, which is a job, but you're not necessarily a modeler or a sculptor or a texture artist. So depending on what you want to be. So if you want to be, a modeler, sculptor, texture artist working on environments, then learning how to make sculpt things like a tree trunk or rocks and integrate them with scans if you want things to you know look super realistic. It's it's good stuff to practice. So yeah, Pat, I would say definitely if you're looking to study 3D in school, I would play with it first to make sure that you like it. So I'm now gonna, where is this dude? There he is. And even though like the back of this thing is facing out, out, away from the center of the environment, I'm gonna sculpt the whole thing because I may reuse this asset. I may spin it around and put it in another part of the environment. So, cause again, what we're seeing in ZBrush is not everything that's gonna be in this environment in the end. These are just like some of the building blocks. Uh, Yrex, that's what I was talking about earlier. Just like using your free time to try and fill the th gaps in your portfolio that you're not, that your job isn't allowing you to do. You know, I've known people that have been environment artists at studios who dream of being a character artist. Like maybe you've been an environment artist for five years. And you're like, you know, I'd really like to try being a character artist. But if your job is all environment art, then obviously you're not going to get stuff for your portfolio that way. And so that's where your free time allows you to make like a career change. Um, 
Aiden, how many hours would I say that I work and work a week in modeling and VFX programs? Well, it depends on what time of the year you're talking about for me, because obviously with Noman, I have a lot of responsibilities that don't have to do with image making. Um, and so that's just the nature of, of having a school. Um, even though there's a ton of amazing people that work at Noman, um, I'm still busy um, doing all the stuff I have to do. And uh, so it depends on if I'm working on a project or not. So let's say like the Unreal Fellowship, where I showed that short earlier. Um, come on now. Uh, so for the Unreal Fellowship, for five weeks, all I was doing from when I woke up until I went to bed seven days a week was Unreal. So when I say that I made that short in three weeks, that's not three 40 hour weeks. So, I mean, it's literally wake up, make coffee, you know, um, try to work out a little bit. I wasn't great about it during the fellowship, even if it's just going for a walk. Um, uh, for like, you know, an hour and then uh, get to the computer. So ideally buy the computer at the computer by uh, 8 a.m. and then on the computer until pretty much uh, midnight or one in the morning, seven days a week for five weeks. So, like that was my schedule for that. Because when I'm working on a project, I tend to get obsessed and it's like all I think about and all I want to do. So, so I've had a lot of periods where for personal work, that's what I'm like. Um, while for a job, it's different. Obviously, a job at a studio depends on the hours of the studio. It could be 40 hours a week, ideally. So 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. with one hour lunch break. And then for, you know, people who do have jobs who do personal work, usually for them, it's, you know, going to depend, you know, people that are younger, don't have family or kids, it's kind of easier to spend, you know, six hours every evening doing personal work than it is once you have other responsibilities. Um, am I looking at reference while I sculpt the rocks? Um, I'm, I'm not for these. So just because, uh, I'm letting myself just do organic rock shapes based on, uh, kind of just having fun with it, but I've sculpted rocks before, uh, looking at reference. And so some of those kinds of shapes, you know, I've been doing environment stuff for a while. So I've like just looked at a lot of um, inspiration and done lots of road trips and been to national parks and camping and all the things that kind of stick stuff in your head. Um, but really I would be smarter to have reference up if I wanted these shapes to stop looking the same. Uh, here, I'm sorry, I'm just going to scroll up again because I'm falling behind on some of these questions. Can you make, so AVT Pro, SP Paint, XGen, even Mental Ray, but can I just make blobby geometry to make it look like a forest? You can, if you want it to be stylized. How and where is Darren Crumweedy? Darren is uh, home in Pasadena, I would imagine right now. Uh, he's good. Um, <clears throat> still very involved with Noman and working really hard uh, with me on getting campus and everything ready for the reopen next month. 
Uh, Ahmed, is Blender ready to be used in big projects in the industry? I think it's probably starting to, maybe more in art departments than um, in like post-production. I'm going to remesh, remesh this uh, rock. Just go down. Da, 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 da. Uh, Fernando Gabriel, how do I see competition? Do you think creating your own VFX studio is possible and logical? Every VFX studio out there was started by somebody, so obviously it's possible. Is it easy? No. Very competitive with not great margins. It's a lot more stressful to own a studio than to work at one. So keep that in mind. Uh, Pat Gibson, your end goal is creature and character design. Yeah, then definitely ZBrush. So being able to block things in 2D to design, like, you know, and then get into 3D to sculpt them is critical for character creature artists now. Uh, Wipeout, trying to get into games industry with 3D artists, but it's so difficult to get. Feedback on your portfolio when applying for jobs, most companies don't even give you the time of day. Um, I would su suggest reaching out to people directly online. <clears throat> places like Discord, places like Facebook. Try to find online mentorships, even if they cost money, um, or places where you can take classes um, so that you can get that feedback because feedback is critical. Uh, but don't expect feedback from studios that you're applying to because imagine how many people apply to those studios and how many people are asking those studios for free feedback. It's just, they don't have the manpower to do it. So it's just not really feasible for them to do that, especially if you're talking about big studios, um, places like ILM or Disney, where literally thousands of people apply to those studios. And sorry, I keep stopping on the sculpting. I'm just trying to catch up on questions. Sadim, good night. So I think I missed that a few minutes ago, but sleep well. Yeah, Discord groups for sure. Art events, yeah, that's a good advice from Adam. So going to events like Lightbox Expo, which is going on this week, it's definitely awesome. A lot of portfolio reviews for sure. So if you have, if you're not aware of Lightbox Expo, Google it. Um, and it's uh, started last night and it's going, I think, until Sunday. Um, tons of artists are there. So, and it's online. Um, Aiden, you're wondering about the average amount of hours a week for an undergrad student coming in as a freshman. It's, I mean, it's from when you wake up till you go to bed. <laughs> it's, really what it is for sure um because i went to two colleges so i'm gonna get back to sculpting so i went to two colleges so i went to a, a private high school which i hated uh it was very academic and um i ended up going to a liberal arts college which was a very good college it was an ivy league college um university of pennsylvania and even though it was an ivy league college and a good school. It wasn't very good for art. And I, it, this was before I discovered 3D really and knew that that's what I wanted to get into. So I was just trying to figure out what do I want to do? What's my major going to be? All that kind of stuff. And I would say I spent maybe like no more than 30 hours a week, my first two years in college between class time and homework, because I just wanted to socialize. I wasn't really that into my classes. So I spent a lot of my time being social for those first two years. And then I discovered 3D and decided I wanted to get into art and realized that the college I was at didn't have that stuff and, and wasn't really the right place for me. So I decided to take a year off. I've told the story before, but you know, for you, I'm just sort of repeating it. And in that year off is when I really discovered 3D. I got a job at a comic book company as a colorist, which was awesome, coloring uh, comics with Photoshop. And I started to realize that I could support myself, even if the salary wasn't great at the comic book company. And that I decided I wanted to be a full-time artist, but like 
for a living. And, uh, you know, my mom wasn't very happy about it because I was dropping out of an Ivy League school. So, like, from her perspective, it was a horrible thing to do and super risky and all that. Anyway, I discovered 3D. I got obsessed with it. I started drawing all the time and learning these 3D tools. I got into art school, uh, which at the time uh, I went to Art Center in Pasadena because there was no school like Noman back then. There were no VFX schools or 3D centric schools. And uh, and once I got to Art Center, you know, art's one of those things that like it's not finished until it's due. And it's very easy as an artist to be self-critical and insecure and be aware of your favorite artists and how good their work is. And you just keep working on it and working on it and working on it. So I went from being a student in college where I was trying to put the minimal amount of time in just to get a grade, thinking that grades mattered to going to art school and realizing that the grades don't matter, the quality of the work matters, and you being proud of your work matters, and, and having friends that are all motivating each other, and trying to impress your teachers, and, and ultimately trying to get a job. And I fell in love so hard with 3D, it's all I wanted to do. So literally from when I woke up until I went to bed, seven days a week while I was in art school, all I did was homework. But it was awesome, and it was amazing. And, uh, and I still feel that way, you know, that like, that's why I'm doing art jam. It's like, it's because I like making stuff. And with my job at Noman right now, like I don't have, you know, making art isn't part of my job per se. Um, and so art jam gives me the opportunity to do some personal work. Um, and like I said, with the fellowship, you know, last month from when I woke up until I went to bed, so when you lucky enough, if you're lucky enough to find something that you like doing that much, you're going to eventually get good at it. And that, that's basically how it works. So if you're, you know, so, so does that mean no man's hard? It's like, well, it's hard. It's long hours. It's competitive, but in a positive way, you know, so hopefully that kind of answered your question. So it's, it's, and you know, the harder you work and the more hours you put in, the faster you're going to get better. Is this dude? There he is. All right. So yeah, I think that. Uh, so I'm not saying that like at a school like Noman you have to put in that kind of time. I think you're just going to want to put in that kind of time, especially when you're surrounded by classmates that are doing the same thing, and you're doing it together. You know, you're hanging out in the labs together. You know, you'll find that you will find a group of people that are into the same thing, where for a lot of our students, it's been hard to find that, you know, where in high school, we maybe felt a little ostracized or a little weird for being super into fantasy and super into sci-fi and, you know, super into video games. And But once you get to a place like Gnome and everybody's that way, so which is awesome. Cuz like I was hardcore into games in the 80s when you know, not just <clears throat> video games on console but also like computer games like RPGs back on like Apple IIs and Ataris long ago. And I didn't know anybody was into that stuff, so I felt pretty weird for being into it. But once I got that job at that comic book company for the first time, I was hanging out with people who knew who Frank Frazetta was or Simon Beasley or all these artists that I was really into. All right, I'm going to sort of scan a little bit. I'm sure I'm missing questions, but I'm trying. Um, Aiden. Da, 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 da. <clears throat> Worry that your portfolio won't show a lot. Just keep working on it, though. You know, drawings, sketches, sculpture, photography, anything. All of that stuff just shows your creativity and your passion, which is really the main thing that people need to see.
Hmm. So obviously a big part of sculpting these things is, you know, silhouette and just trying to make them look like I'd be able to use them regardless of what angle I'm looking at them from. CG Geeks and Create with Clint are good Discord groups. Awesome. Thanks for sharing that. I need to save because we're starting to run out of time. Um, but hopefully you can start to see that these shapes of these different rocks are starting to, you know, go from looking like pillows to looking like these organic, organic rocky shapes. And, uh, and hopefully once I get through the rest of them, um, you know, it's just a matter of time to sculpt everything that's in here. And so it might take a, you know, several hours, but it's fairly relaxing. You know, once I have a strategy down for what the shape language is for, uh, this environment, then it's just a matter of, you know, putting on music and relaxing. And so I think that, you know, Talking, answering questions, streaming, I think, uh, you know, slows me down a little bit. But it still is, you know, a process that takes time. So, like, to basically do what I did in that area across the whole environment um, will take a few hours. But at least when it's all done, as with anything 3D where you're not kid bashing, it's like, you know, it's sculpture. I'm sculpting a little environment that eventually will become a little interactive place that we can walk around in Unreal. So, and uh, I'll try and keep this project for the streams just so that it continues to evolve. Um, you know, maybe I'll try and put a little bit of work on this sculpting between now and next week if I can find the time. You know, I've got a lot of stuff between now and then. Just so you don't have to watch me sculpt these rocks again on the next stream. Um, but, uh, but I think seeing the whole process once, you know, I get through this project might be a useful thing to, to have a little archive of, uh, Pat Gibson, you've heard from several pro artists that it's a perhaps more accessible path to become a 3d modeler first and then work into concept art after for sure. Even Ian Joyner, Joyner told me that modeling is like a masterclass and you can learn what design works that way. That is very true. And, uh, you know, Ian is somebody that, you know, we've worked with a few times. He spoke at Noman many times and uh, did Noman workshop titles back in the day when he was a blur. And uh, concept art is way more competitive than modeling. Not to say that modeling isn't competitive, but there are a lot. If you look at a studio, let's say like ILM, where there's thousands of people, how big is the art department? You know, 30 people. Um, and the same thing is going to be true at any studio that the art department is generally a lot smaller than the other departments. But the thing to remember is that being a modeler is still a creative position. You're still designing because the concept art you get often is very rough and very loose and you have to finish the design as a modeler, as a sculptor. 
So everybody's part of the creative process, whether you're a modeler, texture artist, lighter, materials, uh, animation, effects, etc. So that's where you can't think that only the concept artists are the artists. You know, there's this kind of like perception that that's the case, but it's not true at all. And so obviously being a concept artist is rad, um, but you shouldn't, I think the advice that Ian gave you is very good, where in the end, it's like getting a job in the industry will develop your design sense, whether it is a job as a modeler or a texture artist or anything. And then you'll be able to develop that skill. And, you know, the better modeler and sculptor you are in ZBrush, eventually people will see that you are a good designer and that the concepts they give you they might start to realize like you know this artist doesn't need super specific concepts because they're such a good designer so you know if concepts come in that are looser that need a lot more finish to them to resolve the design then the person who is the best designer slash modeler might get given those assets and then eventually you prove yourself you know as a modeler who's also a designer. So look at Fausto Di Martini, look at Vitaly Bulgarov. They started as modelers and then eventually became art directors. So both Vitaly and Fausto were 3D modelers first. And Ian Joyner and Josh Herman. Create with Clint was made by a guy who's doing big contests lately. I think 4,000 artists participate. 4,000. That's awesome. That's a lot. Scampy NZ. Does that mean you're in New Zealand? Uh, yeah, Pat, I agree that... Uh, you know, design is a hard thing to teach, you know, technique, you know, teaching tools, teaching software, you know, is one thing. Teaching design can be taught from the perspective of giving people the knowledge of how to see and develop observation skills. But design is also based on all of the input that you've had in your entire life, all of the movies you've watched, all the games you've played, all the traveling you've done. And because of that, your life experience is a big part of it. And that extends way well beyond and before school for a lot of people, you know, and then afterwards as well. And experience is a big part of it. So I think that that's where why let's say you're trying to you know study something like environment art it's not just natural environments it's architecture and obviously that's a huge subject that is not easily mastered so it's all just time and research and study and reference and travel and you know and even top concept artists are relying on reference all the time even like sid mead when he did his uh, Nomen Workshop titles, um, which was obviously a really cool experience to be able to spend time with them. And, you know, he was doing a painting of this vehicle and it had some bushes in the foreground in his little color study. And then he went online, Google searched bushes, um, found a bush that he liked for the foreground, printed it out, and then sort of had it on the table as reference as he was painting those bushes. And this is Sid Mead. Like everybody uses reference. And because, you know, when we were in the art department, uh, you know, when I was sharing with Neville, we had an intern who was constantly collecting reference um, for Neville. You know, it's like get reference of cuttlefish, get reference of bioluminescent, you know, sea life you know just things that could be used as inspiration not to copy but just to get ideas so yeah it's it's a it's a process that's awesome that you're in new zealand i'm jealous new zealand is amazing 
So beautiful. Been there twice. And uh, can't wait to go again. All right, people. It's, it's past five, isn't it? Yeah, it's 5.05, so we're five minutes past our time deadline. So I think I'm going to save one more time. And then this is probably, I guess, where we'll stop for today. So still have a lot of sculpting left to do in this environment. Um, but uh, we made some progress and talked about a lot of stuff. So I hope, hope it was somewhat interesting. And uh, well, I had a good time. So thank you, everybody, for, for hanging out. Oh, we got somebody from Greece. That's awesome. Never been to Greece. Definitely would love to one day. All right, everybody. Well, thanks for hanging out. And uh, next week we'll be back, <clears throat> same time, but uh, Josh will be back. His last day of the fellowship is uh, this Friday. So look forward to being able to hang out with him again and, and talk about Unreal and all the stuff that he's learned. Um, and I'll keep working on this project next week. So there it is. So thanks everybody and uh, have a good rest of your Wednesday. And uh, see you next week. Later. And somewhere is a button to end the stream. There it is. All right. Bye, everybody. <laughs>